Good day, all. Just as a little heads up, this video is going out to the Divine Healing Questions and Answers page live stream on Facebook, and it's going out then to be reposted on my YouTube channel. So I will be speaking to both groups today. I don't want my YouTube visitors to feel left out. So I wanted to mention all of you and greet all of you and greet all of you here on the Divine Healing Group. Divine Healing Questions and Answers. And just by way of review, the purpose that this page exists here on the Divine Healing Questions and Answers page is to help those of you that have had prayer for healing or you've been prayed for many times and you still haven't seen any results. This applies to anyone who is listening. These teachings are to help those of you that have been prayed for or ministered to at various times in different ways and you haven't seen the results that you'd like to see, these messages are for you. Yes, they're for everyone in general. Yes, you can share them to bless others. But this is for individual use to help you receive your healing. So, today we're going to be talking about words, words, words. The golden key. This was an interesting thought. Phrase, I should say, that the Holy Spirit dropped in my heart. And I just want to show you, back on September the 2nd, <coughs> I posted a little slide on Facebook with this phrase. I know you can't see it very well, but it says words, 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 the golden key. And that little picture is of a golden key dropping into someone's hand. Hallelujah. And I just sensed when the Lord said that phrase to me, he was dropping a little golden key in my hand too. Of understanding. And a key to help me. A golden key will open any lock. So if you have issues in your body, you've been ministered to, Maybe you've listened to lots of videos on healing from well-known ministers and you're still needing to see results. This little golden key that I just can't keep saying enough. This is God's answer for you. Words, words, words are your golden key. Well, I did a little study on that just to do some research to share with you on the background of that term, a golden key. Maybe you've seen different movies or read books or different things and you've heard that term before, the golden key. So this just came offline, off of the internet, probably I googled it, and these things came up about it. First of all, it's looked at as a literal object, a key you can hold in your hand. A golden key, now listen to this definition. A golden key can be used to open any door. 
right now, if you're in a log jam where your healing is concerned, the door to healing seems to be closed, has shut on you. You can't get it open. A golden key can be used to open any door. And the Lord said, one thing is the golden key. Words. Your words are the golden key that unlocks your door. Whether it's for healing or any of the other redemptive benefits. A golden key can be used to open a door, any door. Even a door that is made of gold or that is locked with even a golden keyhole. So let's say Jesus, it says in Colossians, in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So Jesus is like, uh, has that, that little treasure box and it has a keyhole and it's a golden keyhole and God wants to open it for you. So he sends his word. See, he has reached you. His word has been his golden key to reach your heart, to renew your mind, to heal your body, to restore your soul. Oh, so much is just coming to me right now about how this key is so beneficial in all areas. Say your soul is all locked up from things that have happened to you possibly in the past. God's word is a golden key that will open all of those locked doors and restore your soul. But I must go on. A golden key can be used to open a door that is made of gold or that is locked with a golden keyhole. Now, this is under just a worldly definition that is one of the ways it's used is as a literal object. This type of key is often used in fantasy stories or in stories about treasure. Then another way, it's used as a metaphor. A golden key can represent something that unlocks a door to opportunity or success. So what is success for you? Having a life of wellness. For example, someone might say that they have found the golden key to their career, meaning they have found the job they are passionate about and that allows them to achieve their goals. The golden key can be interpreted in many different ways. It can represent knowledge, understanding, opportunity, success, or even human potential. Now, these are just worldly definitions of the golden key phrase. The golden key, <clears throat> the meaning of the golden key will vary depending upon the context in which it is used. So everybody looks at it as the ultimate answer to any situation. Again, on September the 2nd, I went back and looked it up. The Holy Spirit dropped this phrase into my heart. Words, words, words. The golden key. Hmm. I didn't say any more about it at the time. It was a seed I was planting, a thought. And what is today, the 19th of September? I've been thinking about that phrase for 17 days now myself. I said, words. You know, we've had a lot of teaching on words. Andrew Womack teaches on words. Charles Capps for years taught about words. Uh, speaking God's word. Uh, just recently, I did a message here on the fact that God is a speaking spirit and he created you a speaking spirit. Words, the word system. God created the world with words. This world is set up to operate on a word system.
<laughs> Hallelujah. Here are some examples in literature and mythology where the term the golden key was used. In the story, the wonderful Wizard of Oz, the golden key is used to open the door to the Emerald City. You see the parallels between that little story. Maybe some of you all, this been, was a movie that came out back in 1939, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, about a little girl. And she wanted to go over the rainbow and find the life that was over the rainbow, the wonderful life. And in that movie, there was a little golden key that was used to open the door to the Emerald City. That's like redemption land for us, the ultimate of living. So those are just some ways that the phrase and some understandings of the phrase, the golden key, how it's been used in culture and society, in literature. In, in movies and things. Here's another interesting verse for you. I thought of this verse as I was praying, and these are just different verses that have popped up to me. The golden key is also a word fitly spoken. See, a word again. A word fitly spoken. Jesus said, by our words, we are justified or blessed, and by our words, our words. Do you see what that says? Our. He's speaking of our language, the words we say. By our words, we're blessed, justified, or by our words, we're cursed or condemned. So Proverbs 25.11, though, says that the golden key is a word fitly spoken. Like apples of gold, this is Proverbs 25, 11. Like apples of gold, a golden key. This time I'm using this verse and I'm likening it to a golden apple. Like apples of gold in frames or settings of silver is a word spoken at the right time. When you get a bad report at the doctor's office, whatever words come out of your mouth need to be a word fitly spoken. <clears throat> that was the complete Jewish Bible version, by the way. Like apples of gold in settings of silver is a word spoken spoken at the right time. A word spoken at the right time is a golden key. Here's the contemporary English version. Like apples of gold in settings of silver is a word appropriately spoken. Hmm. Geneva Bible. The right word at the right time is a golden key. I've added that, of course. The right word at the right time. Then we have the New International Reader's Version. A word spoken in his place. I thought that was very interesting. His place. Hmm. So it's like each little word is a person. A word spoken in his place. Mm. You know, isn't that what Jesus was? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. All things were made by the word. The word, the golden key. Without that golden key would nothing have been made that was made. And that golden key of words took on flesh and dwelt among us. Can you imagine Jesus? He said to Peter, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. 
I can see Jesus. Just pretend with me now. He's the Word of God, tabernacled in flesh. He's like a golden key living in this body, the golden key of words, because he was the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word took on flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I just see Jesus as that golden key, the key to the kingdom, the key, oh, hallelujah, to knowing God. No man has seen the Father at any time, but I've come down from the Father, as it says in Hebrews chapter 1, that he is the express image of the Father. Hallelujah. Jesus is the golden key to understanding the Father. Hallelujah. Oh, my goodness. Well, that's another story altogether. Father, I have to pray today. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Heavenly Father. Carry us away, Lord. Beyond the rainbow. Help us, Father. Help, help, help those that hear this message to puff up on the inside so that they really realize they're a speaking spirit living in this body. They are one of your golden keys living in a human body because they've been born of your spirit. They're new creations in Christ. They are Christ in them. The golden key of Christ lives in them now. Oh, Father, help us. Help our words to be apples of gold and frames of silver. Oh, Father, enlighten our understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. And you know, right then I heard the Lord say, and the more that I enlighten you, the simpler it will get. You know, we think, and I learned from that. I said, yes, Lord, I hear what you're saying. Because we think a lot of times, oh, we need to get deeper revelation. We need to get more. I've got to step. The gospel is simple. The simplicity of Christ. And the Father reveals things to us to make it simple for us. One truth. Words, words, words. The gold, golden key. The one thing that unlocks your future, your life of wellness. Genesis 3, talking about God being a speaking spirit. Words, again, words. God used words. They were his golden key. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God said, and God said, and God said, and then God said, let us make mankind in our image and after our likeness. So words are God's golden key. In creation, he used that golden key, the golden key of prophecy in the Old Testament. The prophets came forth and told Isaiah 53 of our the coming Redeemer. Um, Isaiah 7 said he'd be born in Bethlehem of a virgin. God used that golden key of spoken prophecy to prepare the world for the coming of the Messiah, of our redemption. So God uses words, the golden key of words. We have yet verses that haven't been completely fulfilled they will, be unfit, they will be fulfilled because the key is in the lock. When God spoke those words, the key went in the lock. And when the time comes, like Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour, only the Father. And when that day and hour comes for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, that golden key that went in that lock, when the Father said that and Jesus said that, that key is going to turn. And the Lord Jesus is going to come back. Hallelujah. So God uses the golden key of words, words, words. Then what about man? Genesis 1.26, God said, let us make man in our image. 
a word user after our likeness and let them have dominion. How were we to take dominion? Over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over all the earth, over all the earth, over all the earth, over what all's in the earth today. Sickness and diseases in the word world today because of Adam's transgression. You are to take dominion over it because God gave mankind dominion. <clears throat> you as the new creation have the dominion restored. It was lost in Adam, but you now, the new creation, are not of this creation anymore. You've been refathered from above, and you have the name of Jesus to use to take the dominion that Adam didn't. Going on down, God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion. Well, how are we to do that? Genesis 2, 19 and 20, God taught man how to take dominion. Mankind, a speaking spirit, let us make man in our image. God is a spirit. That word image in the Hebrew is meaning like a phantom, a representation. But a phantom, I thought, was very interesting because a phantom we think of as being a ghost, a spirit. So God is a spirit. Let us make man after our image, a spirit like us. And after our likeness, the word likeness means shape or form. God looks like us. We look like God. He has a head, arms, a body, etc., etc. But we are, this is the tabernacle we live in, but we are a spirit. The body without us, the spirit, will be dead. Your body, without you, the spirit, will die. You, the Spirit, are the energizing force of this body. You know, it isn't just the breath that you're breathing. What causes the breath to work? What causes your body to take breaths and things like that? It's because the Spirit that is within you is energizing this body to function the way God created it to. Going on, though. Man is speaking spirit in Genesis 2, 19 and 20. Adam was the prototype man. So let's see what God taught him. Now don't remember Adam didn't know how to what to do or how to function after God breathed into him the breath of life. So the Lord's going to give him some lessons. And the low, out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and he brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. God could have named them all but he didn't. He wanted to teach Adam how to operate in words, 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 the word system. He brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called, listen to this, whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. The name stuck. Whatsoever Adam called them, that was their name. Words, words, words. Hmm. The word system. And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. Hmm. Adam, if you will say its name, that's what it will be. Hmm. Well, my belief, Mark eleven twenty three 23 says, if you will say, you will say to the mountain, be lifted up and be cast into the sea and then not doubt that what you say will come to pass. You will have what you say because words are the golden key. If you will say, how about Romans 10, 9? The words, again, are the golden key to salvation. 
If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart. Ooh, I see something right there too now. Thou shalt be saved. How did we get saved? Words. Hallelujah. How do we move mountains? Words. Jesus taught us this principle too. It wasn't just the Father teaching Adam to use words. Jesus taught us to use words. Romans 12, or Revelation 12, 11. You overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the word. Words, words, words are your golden key to overcoming Satan. Words, words, words were your golden key to getting saved. Words, words, words are your golden key to a life of wellness. Any mountains of illness to be gone and wellness to take its place. Every organ and tissue to function the way God created it to function. This is an interesting little reading here by John G. Lake. This is page 15 in the little book called Dominion Over Demons, Disease, and Death. He said, I cannot imagine that when Adam wanted the cows or the sheep he went out with a dog or a club to get them. Living as he did in the place of God, where God had the fullness of access to his nature, he had a better control of the cows and sheep than that. I believe that when he spoke to the cows, they came home. That when he wanted the birds, he said, come, and they came. It is good for a man to know and exercise the authority of God. Let me read that again. Wasn't that good? I just feel I need to read that again. I cannot imagine that when Adam wanted the cows or the sheep, he went out with a dog or club to get them. Living as he did in the place where God had fullness of access to his nature, he had better control of the cows and the sheep than that. I believe that when he spoke to the cows, they came home. That when he wanted the birds, he said, come, and they came. It is good for a man to know and exercise the authority of God. It is good for a man to know and exercise the authority of God. Isn't that wonderful? That was John G. Lake. He died back in 1935. But he knew some things. Jesus teaches how to use the golden key of words. We're going to look at two examples from the life of Jesus. One was the story of the fig tree. And the other one was the story of the man whose son was thrown into the water in the fire by the demons. And the disciples couldn't cast them out, cast him out. So we're going to look at that, and you'll be surprised that Jesus, in that context of that boy getting healed, taught this very same principle, that it all came down to words. The disciples didn't believe that when they said, come out, he'd come out. You'll see. In Mark 11, 12 to 25, I just love this story, and I think that we'll stop here after this today, and we'll pick up with the other, because the other's too good. It's a the interpretation I want to put on the demon that threw the boy into the water and the fire is different than what you usually hear. So I don't want to get into that today. I want to just spend some special time on that. But here, going back to Mark 11, and we're all very familiar with this, Mark and Mark 11, Jesus was teaching how to use the golden key of words. Mark 11, 12 to 25, the next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry and seeing in the distance a fig tree. He went to find out if it had any fruit and when he reached it, it had nothing but leaves. 
because it was not the season for figs. That's what the King James says. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. We all think, well, why did he go pick on that tree if it wasn't the season for leaves any or figs anyway? Well, we'll see. Then he, uh, I cannot imagine the Son of God standing there talking to a tree. Do you ever just stop and think about that? That'd be like, if I looked out my window right now, my husband's outside doing some things today. Beautiful day here in southwest Tennessee, by the way. But if I looked out the window right now, and I saw him standing out there talking to a tree, I'd go, what is the matter with him today? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I mean, we do. In our natural thinking, we go, what is that guy doing? Standing out there talking to a tree. Do you marvel at this verse? <gasps> Ooh. See, we read these verses, but we don't marvel at them. We don't stop and go. We don't role play them out in our minds. We don't see ourselves inside the skin of Jesus talking to the tree. We don't see ourselves inside the skin of the disciples standing there hearing him and watching him talk to a tree. Now, if you started following somebody that claimed they were the Messiah and everybody thought he was just that son of Joseph and Mary, the carpenter's son, whatever, from Nazareth, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And you're getting all of this opposition heaped up on him? from following him, and you saw him standing there talking to a tree, what would you do? We'd probably all want to pack our bags and go home. I'm sorry, this isn't quite the band I signed up for. I'm getting off of this bandwagon. <laughs> Put yourself inside the skin of the disciples watching this go on. You can learn a lot by role-playing these things through in your own in your own thoughts, in your own emotions. All oh, your emotions will kick in and you'll start feeling what they must have felt. Your emotions will kick in and you'll start thinking how Jesus, how he was thinking, how he was feeling, how he was operating when he said to the fig tree, no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples heard him say it. He said it loud, he didn't whisper it. He said it loud enough, the disciples heard him say it. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. Now this is verse 20. In the morning, the very next morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. I don't know if you've ever seen a tree that was withered up from the roots, but it's a most shocking sight because the trunk and everything is still in the ground and the roots, but the whole top of the tree is just bent over like that and withered like a, a flower that was in a flower pot. It was withered from the roots. So when a tree... The disciples knew when they saw that tree looking like that, that it wasn't from the top down the tree died. It was from the roots up. That is a divine principle that you need to learn in order to have a life of wellness. Your issue goes away from the root up, not the top down, not the outward down, not the roots you couldn't see. They couldn't see the roots of that tree, but they saw the effects of the roots withering. That's how faith works. When the word is spoken, the roots wither. Mm. Whew. Jesus, hallelujah. I believe it, Lord. I believe it. I believe that when I speak to a condition in my body, it begins to wither immediately from its root. 
Everything that you deal with has a root. It has a root spiritually that came from Adam, and it has a root physically from where it's uh, sprouted forth in your body. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the root, and Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed is withered. What did Jesus say next? Have faith in God. So that very phrase tells us that Jesus wasn't just doing something because he was Jesus. He was getting ready to teach a lesson. This was a lesson of how to use words spoken with faith in God. Words spoken with faith in God. Hallelujah. Have faith in God. Now, a couple of days ago, on the Divine Healing page, I posted some versions of Mark eleven twenty two. How the accurate translation is, have the faith of God. And I listed some versions and Worrell's actual translation from the Greek of God. Have the faith of God. Now, if you're born again, Galatians 2.20 says it's no longer you that lives, but it's Christ that lives in you. And the life that you now live in the flesh, the life you now live in the flesh, you live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved you and gave himself for you. Oh, my, 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 my. So Jesus is in you, and the God kind of faith is in him. So you have now the faith of God. These men were not born again yet. Jesus was just giving them an example of how, when you have the faith of God, how it works. You may not have it in your head because you're a spirit. Your head isn't where Jesus lives. He doesn't live in your emotions. He lives in you, the spirit. You are a spirit. You possess a soul. You live in a body. The faith of God lives in you, the spirit. That's why I keep emphasizing to you Become aware that you are a spirit. I am a spirit. I possess a soul. I live in a body. Hallelujah. But I am a spirit. Anyway, going on. These things must be spiritually discerned. Spiritually discerned according to the new creation revelation, the gospel that was given to Paul the Apostle. Hallelujah. We look at Mark 11 through, Gala whew, through Galatians 2.20. Now, you look at Mark 11 through Galatians 2.20 now. Do it. Get off Galatians 2.20. Underline, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Then read Mark 11 and see what happens. And if you don't see it right away because you've been so programmed with tradition, looking at trying to get the faith of God, instead of understanding as a new creation, you have the faith of God. Galatians 2.20, it's no longer I that lives, but it's Christ that lives in me in the life that I now live in the flesh. If he hadn't put that phrase in there, we'd have thought it meant heaven. We will get it all when we get to heaven. But he said, the life that I now live in the flesh, this sick flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So you read this over and over and you think of your sickness being that fig tree. Put your illness, put your roadblock that's wanting to stand in the way of your life of wellness, put it where this fig tree is at. Speak to it. Words, words, words. The golden key. 
Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Verse 23, truly, I tell you, if anyone, yes, that means you, you're an anyone. If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Now, I'm taking it for granted that you're speaking in line with your redemptive benefits. You're not just out there yakking about anything, saying anything, and I'm going to be a millionaire tomorrow, and all of that foolishness. <laughs> tomorrow, I mean 20. No, not that it couldn't. Joseph went from the pit to the palace <laughs> overnight. But look at all the years that went before that. Anyhow, you know what I'm saying. If you say... If you say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and you do not doubt in your heart that you'll have what you say, you'll have it. Words are the golden key. Speak to the mountain. Jesus is teaching us how to use the golden key of words in Mark 11, 22 and 23. Therefore, I say unto you, even in prayer, Believe it, you receive it, and it will be yours. And then also, when you stand praying, forgive. Get yourself in a right spirit so you can speak right words. You want to speak words that are apples of gold and frames of silver, a word fitly spoken. So keep your heart right. Forgive when you need to. <clears throat> forgive others when you need to. If you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. Now, I just want to read to you a little bit about this fig tree. It was Jesus picking on the fig tree when he cursed it, the way it reads here. The time of figs was not yet, and he cursed it. Well, fiddle anyway. What will you do that for? That, that's being a mean Jesus. <laughs> Matthew Henry, now. I just went through some commentaries. Matthew Henry, my goodness, he was lived back, I think, in the 1800s. He wrote some commentaries. He said he found nothing but leaves. He hoped to find some figs, fig, fruit, for though the time of figs was near, it was not yet. But this tree was even worse than any fig tree, for there was not so much as one fig to be found upon it, though it was full of leaves. Then another one down here. Here's Chuck Smith. Now, he was the founder of the Calvary Chapel churches. This would have been in April, and figs generally do not become ripe until summertime. However, over there, they have a first ripe fig. And when, when we, he's talking about a group that he took, when we go over there in February and March, you will see these large first ripe figs on the tree and usually they precede the leaves so that by the time the leaves come on the tree the figs are pretty well developed so seeing this fig tree with leaves Jesus figured there might be some of these first ripe figs on it isn't that an interesting story and here's another one David Guzik commentary the leaves talked to Jesus and said there are figs here but there weren't. That's what he actually says. The leaves said, there are figs here. And that's what normally the figs, the leaves came on after the figs. So when the leaves are there, the figs should have already been there. The leaves said, there are figs here. But the figs weren't there. There were many trees with only leaves. And these were not cursed. There were many trees with neither leaves nor fruit, and these were not cursed. This tree was cursed because it professed it had fruit, and it didn't. Hmm. It professed it had fruit, but it didn't. So Jesus just used it as an object lesson. He wasn't picking on the tree. He used it to teach one of the most profound lessons that he taught. And you know, you go back even to the centurion servant, that came to Jesus and um, 
had uh, his servant needed to be healed. And Jesus said, I'll come to his house and heal him. Come to your house and heal him. And he said, oh, you don't need to do that. Just speak the word. Just speak the word only. You see how that only is added on there? Ooh, speak the word only. See, there's where we have to get to. The confidence that all we have to do is speak the word only. Not the word and this, the word and that natural solution, the word and that natural treatment, the word and this. And, no, the word is the golden key. You can take natural treatments. They may work. They may not. Natural remedies, whatever it might be, they may work and they may not because they're not the golden key. You know, people take cancer treatments. Some get healed and some don't. Well, because the man-made treatments are not a golden key. They work for some. They don't work for others. But the Word of God, oh hallelujah, the Word, the creative Word of God, by what? By words that God used in creation. God used words to create. You want health? Then you use words. That's the golden key. Well, I have to say... <clears throat> We've looked at these little commentaries now. The second example, Jesus teaches how to use the golden key of words in Matthew 17, 14 to 20, about the demon-possessed boy. And we'll look at that the next time. I wanted to spend a little more time on that. And I'll read you a few versions here of Mark 11. Have the faith of God. The majority of English versions read, have faith in God. Some of those in the footnotes or margins read, have the faith of God, footnotes or margins. But the ones, these next ones that I'm going to read to you, actually read the faith of God. It isn't in footnotes or margins. The 1899 Dewey Reams, and Jesus answering said to them, have faith, have the faith of God. Have it. Have the faith of God. Have it. Have it. Just have it. Don't try to have it. Don't try to get it. Just have it. And according to Galatians 2.20, if you're born again, you have it. You're working from a position of having it. You're working from a position of being able to speak the creative word. You're working from a position of being able to cast out devils with your word. Heal sickness with your word. Re bring the kingdom, righteousness, peace, and joy into manifestation with your word. Here's a 1599 Geneva Bible. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Have the faith of God. Warrell Version. Have the faith of God. Wycliffe. John Wycliffe. The Morning Star of the Rever Reformation. My goodness, I think he was back in the 1400s. Have ye the faith of God. Then Young's Literal. Have faith of God. And Jesus answering said to them, have faith of God. Have faith of God. I found it rather interesting as I went down through these. The one version is from 1899. Then we have the Geneva Bible, 1599. Then we have Worrells. Now that is more one of the 1900s somewhere in there. Then we have the Wycliffe translation. That was back like in the 1400s. And then we have Young's Literal. And that was like from the 1800s too, I believe. The older versions all say have the faith of God. These modern translators, I think they're scared of saying it. They say, oh, it can't. they have their little interpretive glasses on of their denomination or their theological school they've been to. And say, oh, that's got to be a miss. They, the copyist must have copied that wrong. That can't be, that can't mean that. Jesus must have meant have faith in God. Well, thank you very much. I think I'll hang around with Wycliffe and the Geneva Bible and Young's. It's okay with you. <laughs> Worrells. Mark eleven twenty two. Have the faith of God. Translators generally render this have faith in God. But if this had been the thought, 
it would have been easy to have expressed it in the Greek. Faith originates with God, and those who have real faith, those who have real faith have his faith. Those who have real faith have his faith. How do you know if you have real faith? Are you saved? Are you born again? You couldn't have gotten born again if you hadn't exercised real faith. And real faith is God's kind of faith. God is a real faith God. God those who have real faith have God's faith. <laughs> and then he quotes Galatians 2.20. The same, perhaps, as the faith which is of the Son of God. Hallelujah. Mark 11, 23, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. One simple truth that is the golden key to your situation. Disciples literal, Truly, I say to you, that whosoever says to this mountain, be taken up and be thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but is believing that what he is speaking is coming about, it will happen for him. Just, just oh, several months back I was doing, the Lord showed me. He said, it's not faith in me, in Mark eleven twenty three or 22, what are we reading from here? Uh, yeah. It's not faith in me in Mark eleven twenty three, It's faith in you, that you can have what you say. And you don't doubt that you can have what you said. You don't doubt that you can have what you said because you said it. Who are you? It's no longer you that lives. It's Christ that lives. Who's speaking when you're speaking the word of God? Yes, you're speaking. Your vocal cords are speaking. But you're the spirit, you the spirit, speaking spirit, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit are speaking the word of God, the creative word of God. In the name of Jesus, body you behold. Thank you, Father, that any disease or virus germ that touches, always say thank you, Father, before you begin to declare things. Thank you, Father, that every disease or virus germ that wants to operate in me or touch my body, dies in Jesus' name. And the minute you say that, if you believe it and doubt not in your heart, that thing either dies instantly or it begins dying from the root. See, and then you can't go back. You have to adamantly believe that you have, that it's working, that that thing is drying up from the root, that that door is opening because you put the golden key in it. My, my. The other day I had a little situation just to share a little something. I had a little situation come up the other day. I had a cancer scare. You know, I won't say that it has completely gone away at this particular time. I'm walking it out boldly, declaring the word, looking up something. I was looking up, I looking up something on the internet. I've had a little situation going on. And of course, one of the first pictures that popped up about it was a cancer, a tumor. Fear wanted to get on me. For a whole day, I fought fear after I looked at that picture. And I said, and I just began to rehearse within myself. The Lord began to encourage me. He said, that's another thing. I put up, a, I'm going to go find it here for you right quick. I put up a little golden nugget couple days ago here. I want to look it up so that everybody on YouTube can see it too. And then I thought it was interesting. In my imagination, I saw the golden nugget, but I didn't really see it when the Holy Spirit first said it to me. Because my soul was shaking. See? My body was afraid. Oh no, I wouldn't want to go through having that kind of cancer or this and that. What kind of suffering would I go through? And you know how all of the imaginations get started in your mind. I'm not immune to them. <sighs> and the older you get, sometimes the more it wants to bother you because you know you're closer to the end of life 
that fight that you had as a young person isn't always there like it used to be. That I'm young, I can overcome anything. Well, that kind of goes away with time. <laughs> mm, hallelujah. The Holy Spirit said to me, dig down deep into the face of God. I said, what? He said, dig down deep into the face of God. Well, you're a spirit. Brother Hagen said, and Jesus said, the, 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 your spirit manifests from this area, the loins, out of your belly area flows rivers of living waters. Your emotions are manifest from here, your thoughts from here. But down here is where the living waters roll from. Down here is where the faith of God manifests from. Even though I'm a spirit and my spirit fills my whole body, it just helps you locate where your spirit is manifesting and functioning from in this physical body. So when he said, dig down deep, it was like all of a sudden, I closed my eyes real tight and I focused way down. Just like you take a pair of binoculars and you turn them around backwards and you're looking through that little point at the end. And I focused way down. I put all them thoughts that were wanting to bother me and fear that wanted to hang on me. I just kind of put it all aside and I just hunkered, got inside of myself, in my spirit. And I tuned it all out. I tuned them all out. And I just got down way, I started digging. Digging, 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 digging down deep. See, you can, the faith of God, you can float on the surface of it and act from there. But there are situations, life-threatening situations, where you have to dig down deep into the faith of God and hide yourself there and function from there and direct your thoughts from that place. Speak peace to your body. Speak the word of healing. I said, I don't care if I do have cancer cells in my body. Devil, in the name of Jesus, I curse them. I curse in the name of Jesus any cancer cell that wants to operate in my body in Jesus' name. I curse you in the name of Jesus. You be gone. You dry up from the roots. See, I had to get down here and I had to speak. Like Jesus spoke to the fig tree, I had to speak from here. And then I had to think about words being the golden key. It's the key to my situation right now. It's a key to this terror that's wanting to get on me right now. It's a key to, this, to quieting all these imaginations right now. Whew. And so I said, okay, in Jesus' name, I have what I say. Mark eleven twenty three. 23. I, words are my golden key. I say them and I refuse to doubt that I have what I say. Oh, I went through the whole rehearsal with myself. Then when I wanted to do this little posting on Facebook about it, and I was thinking about an image. I always like to post a little image with it. And so I found a golden nugget. And I thought, oh, that's interesting, because I imagine, what would you picture the faith of God like if you pictured it? And the only thing I could come up with was gold. That's the first thing. See, what does it say about your faith in Peter? It'll come forth more precious than gold. So, and oh, just think of God, the, the oh, God's faith. And so I put it like a little golden nugget, and I put on it. The God kind of faith. Let me show you my little picture I did here. That was my little picture I did. The God kind of faith. Well, maybe you thought, oh, gee, that's an interesting picture she put up today. And then I talked about Mark eleven twenty two. See, you didn't all know that I was speaking to you out of the, my, the experience I was currently having. Hallelujah. 
So when the Father said to me, dig down deep into my kind of faith, then I knew, don't just mouth words. Just don't speak the scriptures and hope they work. You've got to get digging down deep into the God kind of faith and plant your feet in that place and then speak. Like I did when I created the world. With that same confidence, let there be light. And there was, and I heard the Holy Spirit whispering, words, words, words. You know, that's a wonderful phrase the Lord said to me. And am I going to believe it? Now, am I going to believe it? Just because you get a revelation doesn't mean you personally believe it. You go, wow. That's like Jesus said about John the Baptist. He said, oh, you all rejoiced in his light for a season. Then in the parable of the sower, he said, oh, you all rejoiced when the word came on the seed. You're, you're like the one where the, the seed was sown. And you rejoiced in the light of it for a season. But when persecutions and afflictions and tribulations came along, for the word's sake, for the word you spoke, the word you heard, are you going to stick by it? Are you going to refuse to doubt? Are you going to doubt not that you can have what you say? And then he made <laughs> He made me re rehearse. He said, how many times have I taken care of you when you've had cancer? I said, well, Lord, it was this time. And it was this time. And it was this time. And the last time when I had the lump in my breast. And he said, go take and have the lump taken out and trust me. And that little tumor was about as big as the end of my finger. And that's all I did. He said, didn't I take care of you then? I said, yes, you did, Lord. He said, then why wouldn't I take care of you now? Am I the same God? I said, yes, <laughs> yes, Lord, you are. Now, I'm not saying I have cancer. I haven't been for a test. I just went to the doctor and I had a little, got a little prescription for, and I never mentioned anything about nothing circumstance that I have, little thing I got going on. But I'm just not going to fear. What good would it do me? What good would it do me if I found out if I was a little cancer? Well, what good could do it? What good would it do me? I am not going to put myself at my age through all of that and my husband either, or my family. I have the golden key. Do I believe that? Am I going to practice what the Holy Spirit shows has shown me? Words are the... It's becoming more real to me than it ever has been in my whole life, even though I've used confession, learned about Charles Capps back in the 70s, and been healed over and over and over by speaking words. But it's like I saw the speaking of words like for individual situations it came up. Then I would speak the word to deal with them. But to see the speaking word, the final word, the golden key. I've never seen it like that before. It's the solution there. One fix all. So I'm saying, oh, gee. what about that verse that says, to him who orders his conversation aright, I will show my salvation. Well, that can't mean everything. Surely this and that and something else. What do you do when you hear the Holy Spirit say words, 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 the golden key? You think about it. That's what you do. Like I've been thinking about it since the 2nd of September. And I didn't know I was going to have this little physical situation crop up. That's like the Lord just said to me. He said, be confident. Didn't I speak to you about this word situation? I was, I'm talking in my own words. About this, didn't I already begin pouring your foundation for dealing with any situation that might arise? I said, yes, Lord, you did. Have I ever failed you in anything? No, Lord, you haven't. He said, every time you believe me for healing, haven't you received it? I said, yes, Lord, I have. 
But see, in each individual situation, I've ordered my words. I've done my confessions. I'll just do the confession and the word will work and I'll be healed. I'll get out Charles Caps. I'll read my confessions and that will, the word will work because the word is God's medicine and I'll be healed. But to think about the word in my mouth being the solitary answer, the golden key, and the confidence that comes when you begin to see this reality, financial needs, you just stand up and you declare the word of God. I believe every need is met in the name of Jesus. This mountain of debt is moved and you don't back off of it. You have put the golden key in the lock. It'll open. The, 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 the situation that has seemed locked up will open. But again, see the mountain is the problem. You speak to the mountain. You use the golden key on it to get rid of it. Then over in Romans 4 it says, you call things that be not as though they were. You call your wellness into being. I have wellness. I live a life of wellness. I'm pain free. Whatever you need to say, say it. Those are your golden keys you're using. Charles Cap said, the Lord told him, my people are saying what they have instead of having what they say because we still are learning the golden key of Mark eleven twenty three, 23. The golden key of Romans 4, 24, I think it is. Romans 4 something, 17, 18, somewhere along in there. See, this is a revelation that needs to be prayed over in tongues. Just sitting, saying that phrase to yourself, words, words, words. See, your head, my brow knits up. What? How can that be? See, that's my head. That's my emotions when you say, it can't be that simple. My head is saying, I just thoroughly don't understand that at all. So you have to pray in tongues to get your soul over the hump, so to speak. Oh, and your soul comes to rest in that one little phrase. Ah, oh, that's right. All I have to do is speak the word only, and my servant will be healed. Jesus said, he said, speak the word only, and my servant will be healed. Jesus said, you are the only person in all this time that I've been in Israel preaching, teaching, and healing that understands authority, how the principle of authority works, that golden key is authority, represents authority. When it goes in the lock, it's the final authority. Hallelujah. To change your sit, to move mountains and create, to bring into being what currently isn't. Is a life of wellness possible? I said, Lord, you said with long life you satisfy me and show me your salvation. I and I went right back to the same verse that I used before about cancer that the Lord gave me. There is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. He said, you're not condemned to death. I said, I'm not. He said, no. Cancer is not a sentence of death. It's not a, you're not condemned to death if you have cancer. Just speak to it and command it to go. Kill it with words. <clears throat> Took me a year to put all that in practice. <laughs> but I came out with a clean mammogram and I've had a clean one ever since. Oh, my God cannot fail. See, you have to keep walking with him fresh every day. Fresh every day. Even in the truths that you already know, they have to be fresh to you every morning. They have to be fresh bread on your plate. So he says to me, so you don't have to feel... Oh no, I'm condemned to die of cancer now. I'm 77 years old. I'm older than I was. I'm 10 years older than I was 10 years.
years ago in 2012 when I had it before. Oh no, and I don't, I don't have the fight in me I used to have because I'm getting older and my soul just gets tired and this so sort of around. Words, 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 the golden key. He said, you can speak words no matter how old you are. You can speak my word. With long life, he satisfies me and shows me his salvation. Hallelujah. I speak to mountains and they move. I curse fig trees. I've got the same amount of authority in the name of Jesus. I got the same faith in me. My inward man is renewed day by day, like Paul said. Woo! Hallelujah. I'm, I'm the same person that I was 50 years ago when I got saved. Right here is where it all works from. The outward man may be getting wrinkles, etc., etc., etc. But this outward man is only the house I live in. And this mouth still works. And it can still speak and operate that golden key. The minute I say, by his stripes, I am healed. I was, and I am. And I believe that, and I doubt not in my heart, the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead goes to work on whatever issue is working in my body, just like he did in the beginning when he hovered on the face of the deep and God said, let there be light. Four little words. Oh, hallelujah. Remember what the Lord said to us at the beginning today? He said, a revelation is sent to make things simple. And I've said a lot of words today, but it all comes down to just drawing out a simplicity for you. Amen. So, uh, you know, I had someone on Facebook the other day, or no, on my YouTube channel. Oh my, he was ranting and raving at me, another one. And uh, about something. What was it? Well, I'm going to go over here and look it up for you right quick. <clears throat> you know, God doesn't always heal everybody. He puts pain on them and oh, he was just going to town. <laughs> Oh, bless his darling heart and stupid head, as Brother Hagen would say. <clears throat> but see, there's a person there, and I really do feel compassion for them. I was this was on my video. Um, does God quicken? Does quicken in Romans eight? Refer to the dead body or the living one. Not always. Sometimes God tests people like Paul, who had bad eyes, polio, and begged the Lord for healing. Polio? Oh my goodness. The things that people get taught. And God said no. <clears throat> he would use it to keep him humble. And it was such a physical trial that everyone could see his eyes were so bad the church was in Galatia said they would rip out their own eyes and give them to him. And Job was the most unrighteous man on earth and was sick to the point of death and God did nothing but he allowed it. And then we had David. Now this is an interesting comment about David I've never heard before. I don't know where he got this at. David, after he opened the door to lust, was sick for 12 months. Skin and bone and body full of pain. People say God never puts sickness on anyone and need, they need to read their Bible. Oh, he's, he's not done yet. He's still going on and on and on. Well, you know what I said to him? There was no point in arguing with him. I just said, what I teach comes from what I have seen and heard and experienced. So that's my case today as I share these things with you. This isn't taught to me in a theological school, but it's taught to me in the school of life, in my life with God, my relationship with the Word of God, my walking with Him in my everyday situations of life. 
So I just want to encourage all of you today. God's word works. And we need to seriously think about this revelation, this simple thought that he has shared of words, words, words. The golden key. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for your word. Huh, again, Lord, the word that you have given, that words are the golden key. Oh, how simple, Father. You want it to be simple because you want us to enjoy life. Oh, Father, Adam had to work and plow and sweat by the brow. But, Father, now in Christ, we have the blessings and we can speak and see it now. Manifest around us, Father, in fields near and far. Manifest in our minds and bodies, Father. Oh, yes, Lord, we thank you for it. Thank you, Father, for this little simple truth that words are the golden key. Help us, Father, in Jesus' name, to speak your word and be free. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Well, I pray you've been blessed today. I believe you have. I know I have. Like Brother Hagen used to say all the time, I preach myself happy. <laughs> Next time we'll talk about that little story I was wanting to share with you about the boy that had the spirit that threw him in the water in the fire. And the, di the disciples tried to cast him out and couldn't. You'd be surprised. Did you know that right after the end of it, Jesus said when they asked him, how come we couldn't cast him out? He said, because you have so little faith. Now, these weren't born again people yet. Remember, they didn't have the measure of faith like we have. Jesus wasn't in them. But the point I want to make is Jesus used the same illustration about speaking to the mountain and commanding it to be removed as he did in Mark eleven twenty three. Ooh, when I saw that one day, I'm going, whoa, Jesus, you told the same truth, teaching them the same truth in two different situations. And I don't know why, but I had completely forgotten about it being in this story. All I thought about was the fig tree being cursed. I didn't realize it was used, it was used here too. You might want to just look that up, look it over. Matthew 7, 14 to 20. Check in with you all later. God bless you. Oh, share, 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 share my little teaching. And whether you're here on Facebook or you're on YouTube and let's spread the word. Be good seed source. Amen.